Palau is one of those places you really have to see to believe. A beautiful band of several hundred islands sitting way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's almost 600 miles from the nearest land, the Philippines, 1,300 miles from Australia, 1,600 miles from Japan. Palau's reefs are teeming with a stunning array of marine life. The 20,000 residents of this country live close to the water and live off its bounty. It's a life built on fishing and farming, plus catering to the tens of thousands of Asian tourists who come here every year. But despite Palau's isolation from the rest of the world, it can't escape the global effects of climate change and sea level rise. Johnson Taribiong is Palau's president. There is an anxiety here, uh, kind of a doomsday anxiety, like someday this rising sea level will swallow our islands. The ocean, which was once the source of our livelihood and sustenance, had become a threat to our way of life. CBS's hit show Survivor was based here a few seasons ago, but even so, few Americans have ever heard of Palau or know of the U.S.'s deep connection to this place, which runs deeper than just Palau's love of softball. Kids learn English in school, the dollar is the currency, and America is Palau's main benefactor. Palauans have also fought and died in the U.S. military, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and Palau almost always votes in sync with the U.S. at the United Nations. But Palau's relationship with America is fraying, in no small part because America and the rest of the industrialized world are putting record amounts of CO2 up into the atmosphere, which most scientists say is driving climate change. The changes in Palau are visible everywhere. Houses built years ago near the water now sit in the water at high tide. With the small population we have, it is affecting everyone, almost everyone here in, in this country. Sebastian Marino works for the Palauan government. He's trying to help people deal with the effects of climate change. He took us to see homes he says are typical. The beaches have eroded away, trees have been lost, now the very houses are threatened. Just the fact that the water at the highest tide is banging on the back door every day reminds them of the threats that not only affecting this part of the country, but every other low-lying coastal areas around Palau. Another concern here is the increasing damage being done to their taro crop. Taro is a root vegetable which makes up a big part of the Palauan diet. President Taribiang took us to one of the northernmost islands in Palau. It's just a few feet above sea level. And as sea levels have gone up, salt water keeps pushing further inland. The president showed us what salt water has done to the main taro patch that helps feed the 120 or so residents here. All of these, everything, everything. They're dying. Look at, look at them, you know. They're dying. It's if uh, somebody poisoned the, uh, the taro patch. Palau's famous coral reefs might also be damaged by climate change. Not only do Palauans rely on the fish they catch along those reefs for food, but they're also what draw all those tourists here. According to one study, tourism generates over half of Palau's income. Many scientists believe that as the oceans continue to warm and become more acidic, reefs worldwide will suffer. If Palau's reefs were damaged, it would be an enormous blow, economically and culturally. So you believe the changes that you're seeing here in Palau are caused by forces far outside of Palau? Yes, uh, the consensus in the scientific community is that it's the greenhouse emissions, the carbon emissions, which create the effects of climate change. Because parts of Palau are mountainous, it's actually in better shape than many other low-lying nations around the world. Take the Maldives, a string of islands in the Indian Ocean. Much of the country is just a few feet above sea level. To draw attention to its situation, its former president actually held a cabinet meeting underwater. The Pacific island nation of Kiribati is also being overrun by the sea. It's now looking to buy land in Fiji to evacuate its 100,000 residents. And it's not just small island nations either. Bangladesh, a country of 150 million, has entire towns just above sea level. No one knows where millions of Bangladeshis would go if they need to be evacuated. There is only so much my country can do on its own to protect ourselves. 
President Tarribiong says it's foolish to think we can wait for some international treaty or engineering fix to address this looming humanitarian crisis, especially when past efforts have proven so ineffective. Consider this. When world leaders met in Kyoto in 1997 to try to get a handle on greenhouse gas emissions, those emissions totaled 24 billion tons per year. A decade later, and dozens of conferences later, those emissions had surged to a record 32 billion tons per year. Time is of the essence. I think to say wait is to give in to the challenge of climate change. So, in my opinion, the world has to take some action. The Palawan government isn't waiting. It's launched a very ambitious effort here at the United Nations in New York to try and force global action on climate change. We've got systems available, both in the law and in politics, to address those things. And we need to use them now before these islands disappear. Stuart Beck is an unlikely crusader for a nation 8,000 miles away from his home in New York. He's a lawyer and former TV executive. But after helping Palau in its bid for independence in the 1970s and 80s, and then marrying a Palauan woman, he became Palau's ambassador to the United Nations. Now Bex helped craft a first-of-its-kind legal strategy to bring the weight of international law to bear on greenhouse gas emissions. Since the time I went to law school, the fundamental principle of international law, the reason there's international law, is transboundary harm is not allowed, that activities in one country cannot damage activities in another country. The principle of transboundary harm stems from a case in the 1920s and 30s where a smelter plant in British Columbia was emitting sulfur dioxide. The dioxide got up into the air, crossed the U.S. border, and rained down on Washington state, damaging trees and crops. A joint U.S.-Canadian tribunal ruled that Canada had to stop the pollution and pay damages. Ambassador Beck believes there's a clear analogy to the damage greenhouse gases are causing to places like Palau. And so now, Palau, along with a host of other small nations, want to get the United Nations' highest court to rule whether the industrialized world has a legal responsibility for the damages caused by their emissions. Do states, in a sense, have an obligation for the unchecked emissions, uh, which are now proven to be the cause of climate change and proven to be the cause of the existential threat, which now exists for many island countries, but also, you know, ultimately, like the, the canary in the coal mine, ultimately for everybody. This action is not seeking money damages or reparations. It's seeking a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Michael Girard is one of the top experts in environmental law. He's at Columbia University's law school, and he consulted with the Palauans on their effort. He says the transboundary harm precedent has been applied in more limited cases of dams and smokestacks, but never about greenhouse gases on the global scale that Palau is requesting. Gerard says that if the court sides with Palau's position, it would have major ramifications in the fight against climate change. A ruling by the international court would have tremendous moral authority as well as intellectual heft. It will be far and away the most important statement from any international uh, legal tribunal on climate change. It should put considerable pressure on the major emitting nations to work harder and faster to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. But the court's finding is not binding on anyone. They can't compel Brazil or India or the United States to do anything. So uh, help me understand why this, why this would really have teeth. Many of the countries of the world really do care about whether they're complying with international law and international precedent and public sentiment. But before the international court can even consider the issue, a majority of the United Nations, 193 members, have to vote to ask the court for its opinion. And as pie in the sky as this whole effort may seem, Palau's getting real traction here at the UN. More than 30 nations have pledged support for Palau's initiative. But as the initiative gains momentum, one country has stepped up as the main opposition, the United States.
Just four months ago, the U.S. circulated this memo stating that a legal finding from the court could have a negative effect on other climate negotiations. Negotiations about Palau's initiative, meanwhile, continue behind the scenes. Palauan sources told Need to Know that Australia's foreign minister, Bob Carr, first offered vigorous support for Palau's initiative, but backed away from that support under pressure from the United States. Need to Know was also told that the U.S. ambassador to Palau, Helen Reed Rowe, met with President Taribiong and encouraged him to drop the initiative. Has the United States asked you to drop this initiative? Well, I would not have... I, I don't like to say what they told me, but I simply say they believed that international negotiations like Rio plus 20 Kyoto and all or whatever, of are more subsequent. important than bringing the matter to the court. But I didn't realize that invoking the rule of law would create problems with negotiations. They, they, they can go hand in hand. They're compatible. They're not incompatible. Despite repeated requests, neither Ambassador Reed Rowe nor the U.S. State Department would talk with us. It's worth remembering that the pressure on Palau from the United States isn't just diplomatic. Remember, Palau receives a huge chunk of financial support from the U.S., so Palau has to be very wary of alienating its major benefactor. It seems that you're caught in a, in a very difficult spot. I mean, on the one hand, Palau's relationship with the United States has been very fruitful and very supportive and has helped to build this country into what and it is. And which we cherish and are grateful for. But on the other hand, the United States is also one of the world's great polluters of carbon emissions, which you argue is now serving to tear down or to chip away at Palau. I wonder how, you, how do you reconcile that conflict? I have to be realistic. That's all I can say. Try to convince them without creating a backlash. It's a balancing act. The United States has been clear in their opposition to your initiative. And they argue that they're with you philosophically. And they point to things like new uh, restrictions on coal plants. They've plowed billions of dollars into alternative fuels. And they say an initiative like yours with the UN is only going to serve to muddy the waters and make it more difficult to do the things that, that the U.S. and the international community wants to do on climate change. That's their argument. And say, they say to you, stop. What can I say? I don't agree with them. I don't know what waters would be muddied by this effort because there's so much mud in the water now that you can't see. So, you know, one would think that our existential problem might be of more immediate concern to them. But they'll make their own decisions about that. You know, we just got to do what we got to do. You got to say something. Palau and its partner nations hope to bring the initiative up for a vote at the UN in the next few months. They still believe it's their best hope for making the world take notice, to make sure this paradise isn't lost. We have no weapons, no leverage to bargain with big nations. So our only leverage is the use of the rule of law, the motor persuasion.